We're going to be privileged today to listen to someone from the land of Israel. He actually grew up in New York. So when we listen to him, his English sounds a little like he came from New York. <laughs> but uh, Anok is a dear brother. We've known him for a few years. And he really has a vision for something that the father wants to do. You know, I'm a dad. I have six kids. I think 12 grandchildren. I hope I counted them all. And you know, there's nothing that a father likes like a family reunion. When you're a dad, the family reunion tops everything. And Anok is here to share with us how the Lord has impressed upon him that he plans to have a family reunion. And so we're so grateful today to welcome Anok Young. Do you live in Jerusalem or you live in Modine? I live in Modine. How many here know what Modine has to do with this time of year? This is where Mattathias told the Seleucids, no, he wasn't going to sacrifice a pig on this altar. The rest is <laughs> history. Anyway, we're grateful to have you here. And I'll turn the time over to you and just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much to everyone coming today. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, as someone who is a frustrated rock star. Uh, I have to explain that. I do not know how to play an instrument, nor can I sing. But I was always a little frustrated as to why I couldn't be a rock star, too. Uh, and I'm still struggling with that. Now, I was told prior to coming to this community to expect a lot of musical and vocal talent. And my reaction was, well, I'm going to visit with the House of Aaron, Livy Eam. Of course you would expect that. So, thank you for not disappointing me. <laughs> okay. I'm one of those people very impressed by the Nevi'im, the prophets of Israel, and their messages. So I thought, what a, what a better place to start with a prophetic message, and let's go from there. So we turn to the prophet Amos, Amos, chapter 8, verse 11, who says, I'll say it first in Hebrew and then in English. Hine yamim ba'im, behold, days are coming. I want you to remember that phrase. If nothing else, remember that phrase. Behold, days are coming. Yishach bira'av ba'aretz. I'm going to send the famine to the land. The Lord says through his prophet. But he goes on to clarify. Lo ra'av lalechem. Not a famine of, for bread. Berot sama'al amayim. And not a thirst for water. So wait a second, what kind of famine is this? It's a famine, it's a thirst, it's a hunger for the words of God. The words of God himself. Oh, a quick thing about divine names. Because I know Ephraim likes to talk about divine names. In Israel, we typically say Hashem, meaning the name. Our attempt at deference to the Lord's name is not to pronounce it. However, as you may have noticed, I'm a native English speaker. Not having grown up in the church, or not having loved the church then, I'm not in a situation where I feel that saying God or Lord is something bad. <laughs> if, however, you do, please don't be offended by what I say, <coughs> and get over it. Okay. <laughs> About 20 years ago, I began encountering a phenomenon, a phenomenon similar to what the Prophet Amos was telling us, of people of all different types, from all different backgrounds, looking for the words of God. I began hearing about the Hebraic Roots Movement. I began here. Now, again, understand, I grew up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. <laughs> there was no interest in Hebraic roots. The interest was to kill me because I was the local Christ killer. 
So this was a phenomenon, Hebraic roots. And you know, I would meet people who would say to me, did you know that Jesus wasn't called Jesus? I said, well, of course not. His mother, Miriam, would have called him Yeshua. You, you know that too? It's the land of Israel. What are you talking about? The Noahide movement. All these things were swirling around. And then I began meeting people who identify themselves as from among the people of Israel. They say to me, I think I'm from the people of Israel. I'm Joseph. I'm, well, actually, the first time I heard it was someone said, I'm from the house of Joseph. And I said, the house of what? Because that phrase is not the house of Joseph. Where is that located? <laughs> And I did something which is always a good place to start. I went back to the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And I was stunned because there are 160 references to Judah and Ephraim, or Judah and Israel, or Judah and Samaria, or Judah and Joseph. I was stunned. I had just come across the best kept secret in the entire Hebrew Bible. <laughs> I never heard of this. This is amazing. It is amazing, but it's no secret. Remember our history. We were a united kingdom. People think for centuries. If you add on the time of King David to the time of King Solomon, we're talking about 70 to 80 years, depending how you want to count it. And then, our one people split into two nations. The northern kingdom of Israel, Malchut Yisrael, and the southern kingdom of Judah, Malchut Yehuda. And doing what we've done so well as a family, we waged war, <laughs> we threatened war, It is tough to descend from the most dysfunctional family in history. <laughs> but turn the challenge to an opportunity and say, wow, we can really prove that we've learned our lessons. And we're going to talk more about that. So our two nations, then more than 85% of us destroyed, dispersed, God's punishment, using the Assyrians as his way of showing us. Taken off into the Galut, into the exile, into Assyria. And his people will tell you where the lost tribes then disappeared from the face of history. Astoundingly though, the prophets of Israel repeatedly spoke about their return. And it's in the Siddur, it's in the Jewish prayer book. My co-religionists read it all the time. But I think it's sort of like, you know, some point in the future, a mystical thing kind of being whisked on a magic carpet. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong part of the Middle East. <laughs> Again, my metaphors mixed up. The prophet Hosea, Hosea, tells us that the punishment was that you were to become lo ami, not my people. You were to live, and worse, believe as Gentiles. Remember, Gentiles in the ancient world were pagans. You were to worship idols. You were to totally forget who you were, who your identity was, who you belonged to, where you should go back to. So, so why is this Jewish guy from Israel, who sounds like he was born in the Bronx, was, doing with you in gorgeous Utah? By the way, I have been to Utah before. I changed planes in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I got into several conversations with people who first told me that they were from LDS. The only time I ever heard those initials mentioned 
was as a kid growing up hearing about the drugs, LSD. <laughs> they were Mormons. They were Mormons. We began talking. You see this. So they want to talk to me. They want to talk to me about theology. So the first thing I tell them is I've actually read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I think they wanted to ask why, but they didn't. When they kind of got to, how is it that you came to the Book of Mormon? I was going to say, it wasn't because of those guys knocking at my door. That doesn't do anything for anybody. But I said, I'm researching a book on the return of Ephraim, the reunification of Ephraim and Judah. You know about that? Yeah. One thing leads to the other. We're exchanging information, things contact me again. But my last name is a popular name in the state of Utah. It's Young. Y O U N G. When they met me, they thought they hit the mother load. This is great. Jewish guy, a friar, writing a book. And he's really one of us. I didn't have the heart to tell them that my. My grandparents' last name had been Yankov. And then when my father was working in a men's clothing store, there were three guys by the name of Charlie. And the boss paid for them to, could you imagine this in American labor law of today? <laughs> paid for them to change their names to one or two syllable names. So Charles Blavolt became Ed Brown. And Charles Yankov, my father of blessed memory, became Roy C. Young. But if, if Young can get me in front of audiences in Utah, it works fine. <laughs> now understand something. Because everyone wonders about this afterwards. So I'm going to tell you now. We, the Jewish people, don't believe exactly what you believe. No. Although we are one family. No. Wally Shabbat. <laughs> Spent all Shabbat with a man in, in Nevada. And he okay. The bad. I have to work on that. However, I acknowledge you, accept you, and love you as my brothers and sisters without condition. There's no hidden agenda. I'm not trying to change you into me. And maybe perhaps you shouldn't try to change me into you. Maybe to each of us, we're looking a little like Joseph. A little Egyptian, a little eye makeup, a little difference in the hair, a little difference in the garb. Now, of course, that leads into the big question. So how's there going to be a reunion? And how are we going to be together if we're a little different? OK. The reunion of our people is promised by the Lord himself. Ezekiel, Yechezkel, chapter 37. The Lord says to his prophet that he's going to take the stick of Judah. Oh, and by the way, this is another topic. And those associated with him, those who want to join the board. And the stick of Ephraim, Joseph, and those associated with him. And that he is going to put them together as one in his hand. So stop having a canary. Don't get the undies all tied up in a knot. <laughs> Who's going to give theologically? <laughs> He's going to figure it out for us. We don't have to worry about it. We go on being the best we can as we know it today. And he's going to sort it out. And you know what? Let me tell you as one individual representing myself. Because I find at a time you know, when my daughters are no longer children, I can't even represent them. <laughs> Me. Do I think there'll be a theological correction at the end of time? Well, yeah, actually there has to be, because how are our sons going to marry your daughters kind of thing? Of course, there's this game of liar's poker, because everyone looks at me and smiles and they think, yeah, y'all are going to be the one that's going to change. <laughs> y'all are going to see the light. But you know what? Let me pose a third option. What if the Lord says to us that there's to be a correction, a third option, that maybe 
all of us who are so certain we have all the truth now. Maybe we were misguided, but now we've got the truth, the truth. What if he says, you should be doing a little more of this? And what if he says to you, you should be doing a little more of that? And what if he even says, why weren't you doing more or less of that? You know what? I'm ready for it. And maybe you all should be too. Oh, I, I can explain this to you all business. <laughs> this is a, a, a personal pet thing. First of all, I love the expression. I love southern expressions. Bless his heart. In, in, in the Northeast, we would have said, I'm going to stab that. Yeah. <laughs> so language means something different wherever you are. You come from Ephraim, the northern kingdom of Israel. I come from Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Are you seeing the correlation? Yeah. I'm the southern boy. I get to say all I want. <laughs> now, this inevitable reconciliation, and it is inevitable, and it is in God's time. The reason I've flown so far from home, and I'm a tour guide professionally, which means when I'm not guiding people, I'm not earning a living. So why am I here? I'm here because I feel with all the fiber of my being that we are in a time when the sands of the hourglass are running down. Living in Israel, the bracha, the blessing of living in Israel, I get to see the fulfillment of the prophecy every day. When Zechariah, Zechariah speaks of, and one day the children will again be playing in the streets of Jerusalem. I get to see that every day. The miracles of the rebirth of the state of Israel from the horrific ashes of the Holocaust. You know, people tell me I'm, I'm a dreamer with this, this idea of reconciliation. You're a dreamer to believe that the, the, the promises of the prophets are, are, are going to be happening in our day. Really? If you would have walked over to a Jew in Auschwitz in 1945, and whispered in his ear, hang in there, because in three years there'll be an independent state of Israel. If you would have had the strength from starvation, he would have laughed at you in your face. How absurd. And then what, you're going to tell him that 19 years after that, that the state of Israel, with junky French airplanes and garbage British centurion tanks, would defeat three Arab armies, reunite Jerusalem. Liberate Judea and Samaria. By the way, that's the part of Israel where the Bible was lived. It was never lived in Tel Aviv. The Philistines were there. We never got there. We'll do better this time. <laughs> the Golan Heights, Sinai, Gaza. All right, we made mistakes. We surrender them. But you know what? We have a biblically promised series of borders. We're going to get there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <sighs> Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 3 says, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them. Not just to Western Europe where the white people live. All the countries. And I will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and multiply. But why would I think that this is happening now? You know? I mean, is it, is it kind of, you know... If you wish upon us, <laughs> why? Because I am blessed to live in the land of the prophets. I see every day an Israel that could not have been imagined 65 years ago, actually 66 years ago, the UN partition plan there was to be an Arab state and a Jewish state. And quite surprisingly, I know this will come as a shock, the Arabs said no. They would rather kill the Jews and take all the land. 600,000 Jews in Israel at the time of the War of Independence. 600,000. Now remember, what, mili what modern military tradition did the Jewish people have? Modern. 
Not from the time of the Maccabees or Rav Kok, but modern. Zero. Do you know that Israel makes the world's most advanced battle tank? The Merkava. You know the way that planes have a system? When you fire a missile at a plane, that little, you know, that chafe or other missiles go off to exploit it before it hits? Our tanks have it. I think the Americans should buy it from us. <laughs> we, well, it's, avionics. We improve on the F-16s, the F-15s, and the Apache attack helicopters. We create our own weapons in the top war. We, Israel has become a modern military power. Wait, wait till the rest of the family is home. Just wait. Not that we're going to go off and conquer anybody, but that we will live in security, as was promised, so we could fulfill our mission and become a light to the nations and teach the world the Torah and the Word of God. Behold, days are coming. Jeremiah 31 9. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands afar off. And say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep this. I'm so bad to English. And will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. I will strengthen the house of Judah. He's doing that. Next couple of words. And I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. Because he is compassionate. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. I will signal for them and gather them in. For I have redeemed them, and they shall be as of old. Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me. People all over the world are remembering who they are. It's not a coincidence. And with their children they shall live in return until no room can be found for them. And we're not talking about the little Israel of today. We're talking about the greater Israel. The borders promised. So why now? Why haven't we done it yet? I would love to tell you it's happening now simply because we are the most deserving generation of the last 2,700 years. <laughs> And then you would say, you are either jet lagged, or even though you say you've never gotten high or drunk, you obviously are. No. But his timetable, which is a different time frame than we all live with, is coming to a point where this is beginning to happen. Now, I say beginning to happen. I don't want you to feel bad when I leave, that you've missed out on this great family reunion. You're here in Utah, you missed out on this great family reunion of all time. No, it's beginning to happen now. And I'm here to issue you each and every one a personal invitation to this family reunion, which we are told will dwarf the exodus from Egypt. The world will be astounded by what the Lord will do for us. Okay. Normally when I start speaking, or I, I, I work part-time guiding groups in the Western Wall Tunnels, in the Kotel Tunnels, and I guide in English, big surprise. Now, there are tours in Hebrew or English. However, the English language tour is typically, what it means is it's the non-Hebrew speaking tour. So you have people from all over the world who speak English to a variety of degrees who take part. And I tell them right at the beginning, if you're having trouble following anything that I'm saying due to my very thick Israeli accent, <laughs> you, and typically people begin laughing. This accent, yes, Johnson, is born and bred in the Bronx, in New York City. People ask me all the time, so what made you decide you wanted to come to Israel? And that's the beauty of my co-religionists from here in America. The non-religious American Jews are astounded that someone would leave the United States of America particularly New York City, and go live in Israel. Other than my daughters, I don't have family in Israel. So I tell them, I always wanted to live in Israel. 
from the time I first became an adult. And then they look at my name tag. Again, the last name is Young. So they say, no offense, but even though your name is Young, you clearly are not. So what were you thinking? I could quote scripture, but I'd rather quote, at this moment, song lyrics from someone you may have heard of, a guy by the name of John Lennon, who said, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. And that is so true. I wanted to go live in Israel, and every time I came close to making the move, something went wrong. Grad school loans. I got laid off from a job. When I say job, I was a manager at Exxon, at PepsiCo, Johnson Johnson. I should have been laid off. 20 years of management experience, right? Two graduate degrees were. I got laid off. Things happened. And I used to cry myself to sleep at night, begging for the opportunity to go home to Israel. And then all of a sudden, a little more than four years ago, the window of opportunity opened up, and I jumped right through it without looking back. And I see now that I was kept in America for all those years, all those decades, for one reason and one reason alone. To meet Ephraim, to get to know Ephraim, to share time with Ephraim, to absorb their heart, so I would never walk away from them, ever. Having become a tour guide in Israel is a great thrill. I've got the land of Israel as my classroom. Doesn't get any cooler than that. But that's not the professions series that I had when I was in America. So people ask me, why'd you go to Israel and become a tour guide? <laughs> Everyone wants to know everything about it. <laughs> I went to Israel <coughs> because I wanted to become part of our history instead of just reading about it. There's also a mitzvah aseh, a positive commandment to live in the land of Israel. Period. End. Many of my co-religious don't seem to remember that part. But I became a tour guide because I was obsessed with the thought that when Ephraim comes home, who else is going to be prepared to show them their homeland? Who else is going to know who they are? So how do we begin this process of reunification? First of all, the most obvious. We have to improve our relationship with God. Our individual and collective relationship with God. We have to tune in more to His will and what He wants. We have to draw closer to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. To visit Israel when we can. To learn about Israel. And I've got a whole series of projects that over the next couple of months I'm going to be announcing and sharing for people to be involved with where they can help right now, right here, right where they're sitting. You need to draw closer to your Jewish brothers and sisters. Now understand, however, the majority of American Jews are totally assimilated. They have never read the Bible. So if you run over to them and give them a big hug, and start quoting from the prophet Zechariah, they will likely ask you, Zachary who? <laughs> so we'll figure out ways of doing that. And if it means I keep coming back here, I'll keep coming back here. Here's the hardest part of all though. We need to draw closer to Ephraim, to each other. Now this group here, I'm really preaching to the choir here. You're already close knit community, filled with love and open hearts. But other people who have the understanding of being part of Ephraim, like you, are so busy undercutting each other, stamping each other in the back, and literally and figuratively spitting in the faces of each other, who will walk away from fellowship with each other because they pronounce the divine name differently. Understand, they may not know an Aleph from a Bet in Hebrew, but the Lord visited them 
and told them how to pronounce the divine name. And if you don't do what they say, you're out. What calendar do you use? You name it, the minutia. I'm talking about the reunification of our nation, and they're talking about basically, do you have a button-down collar or not? <laughs> it's as relevant as that. It's stupid. It's wrong. It's not scriptural. And it's against God's will himself. As someone like myself who's looked for Ephraimite groups to interact with, I identify some group on Facebook. If I hesitate and don't contact them within 48 hours, by that point, like amoeba, they will have split off into other groups. <laughs> if I would have had this understanding of asexual reproduction in high school biology, I, I would have been a genius. It's unbelievable. Self-appointed leaders. No sense of working together in a community. Nothing. So when I say to people like yourselves, work with other Ephraimites, I know in talking to this group here today, you're already there. They ain't. We've got to get them there. As my dear friend and brother Ken Rank says repeatedly, how can we extend a hand to people like Hanoch from the Jewish people, from Judah, if we're so busy kicking each other in the shins? And so much worse. Speaking of Ken, for those of you on Facebook, I know your cell service isn't great, but for those of you on Facebook, there's a group that we've started, and it's incredibly radical. So, I, oh good, you're all sitting down. Good. <laughs> Hold the baby tight, because this is going to get really, really shocking. We created a group called United to Restore, with the number two, with the idea that coming from the different sides of the family that we are, we're going to focus on working together on the huge amount of what we have in common and not begin to worry about the silly minutia of what we potentially, and don't always, but potentially disagree with. And let the Lord himself sort it out at the end as he promised that he would. And wouldn't you know that every single week, Ken has to write a new post explaining that he's not giving up his faith in Yeshua at all. But he's not expecting Hanok to believe what he believes. And Hanok's not expecting him to change his views. I told you this is incredibly radical. <laughs> this is really, really something. Okay, now I'm going to read you a quote that's really speaking of radical. But it's not a quote from me, it's a quote from Yeshayahu, the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 11, verse 14, he says something. We really should listen. He says, Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. What do you mean? We're supposed to get along? We're supposed to play nicely in the sandbox? Do you notice when you put toddlers in? Those that get to be mine. And then you teach them how to share. That's what we need to do. Behold, days are coming. Now, what good is it if a family member comes and visits and doesn't bring a present? My mother, blessed memory, told me very bad manners. So I come with a present. I'm going to be handing these out at the end. There's an organization in Israel called U Boutique which is sort of serving as an umbrella for individual artisans, craftspeople, to help them market their products outside of Israel. And he created this lovely bookmark with these great illustrations. And then he said, Hanom, since you're giving these out for us, can I put your name and contact information? I said, yes, right here. And I also have my cards with this pretty blue lion which was a picture of me before I shaved. <laughs> but he wanted to put the traveler's prayer here. But I told him, Catholics have one traveler's prayer. 
Protestants have another Shabbos prayer. Jewish people have another Shabbos prayer. Why don't you put something that Ephraim really needs to see? So we have the prayer for members of the Israel Defense Forces. Here. A prayer for the soldiers, the young men and women of the IDF who every day go out there at an age where here in the U.S., boys and girls, young men and women of that age, <coughs> are in college and they're partying. Our young men and women are sitting on the borders of the land of Israel to defend it for us. So I have one for each of you. Please use it and please share that prayer. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30, uh, excuse me, 3, 18 says, In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Notice, he's not talking about the time yet when we're one, but he's saying the Jewish people and the B'nai Ephraim, the children of Ephraim, will walk together. We'll walk together on our common goal. Our one people has become two nations moving in the same direction in parallel but we're pretty much two religious groups. God himself is going to bring us together and our job is to begin walking closer and closer and finding those things we have in common and sharing them and working together and I'm sorry for rattling cages, spreading this message of unity. <laughs> unity, respect. I told you this is really, John should have warned you. He really should have warned you. Okay, now we go to one of my pet peeves. Amos, chapter 9, verses 9 to 10. The prophet says from the Lord, I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. As corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. And then, of course, he goes on to describe to raise up the fallen sukkah, the fallen tabernacle of King David, our kingdom. All the nations, yes, because there are people out there busy publishing books telling you that they've tracked the migrations of the tribes of Israel all over the place. Even though the prophet Hosea says they will forget their identity as our people, no, they're saying that when they use terms like a D and an N sound, a Dalit and a Nun, like let's say Denmark, they're really from the tribe of Dan. That even though the Lord says they will forget their identity, no, of course they're smarter than the Lord. They are tracking where they're going for 2,700 years. And these people will tell you that the tribes exclusively <coughs> migrated to Western Europe and that they embody the national characteristics of certain countries in Western Europe. But largely the big thing is they then migrated to countries that were in the British Empire, like the United States, Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. The problem is what they're describing in terms of their family reunion is a party for white people only. It's racist. Their intentions may not be racist, but it is racist. You mean to tell me that the tribes of Israel never stayed in Asia? Never stayed in Africa? Now, personally, I'm in contact with the English-speaking ones. I don't speak Chinese very well. I'm struggling with Hebrew enough. So what is it that I want from you people? Okay. I'm going through America being the stranger away from home. Because when people say, well, what's the big deal? You're in America. You're in a, you used to be in America. No. I was a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> there's New York. There's Los Angeles. There's Chicago. Everything else, that's America. <laughs> that's America. I'm here to call upon people to stand up to be revolutionaries for the restoration. We're serious about this restoration, and we need a revolution. I choose the word carefully. I grew up in New York City in the 70s. It was a time of great unrest. Everyone was rioting and 
demonstrating, and everyone had their militant activist faction, and so did we crazy Jews. By the time I was 20 years old, I had already been arrested on three different continents. You know, between your 18, 19, and 20, you're gonna live forever, you're immortal. You can accept any challenge and go for it. So, the year I turned 20, I was one of seven that staged a sit-in in Moscow in the Soviet Union. We went to offer ourselves in exchange for one of the prisoners of conscience, Dr. Mikhail Stern, and we said, he sentenced us seven years of hard labor in Siberia, we're seven young healthy people we can serve out his prison sentence. I'm a lot older than 20 now. <laughs> Six out of the seven of us currently live in Israel. And we see each other from time to time, we buy vegetables, we bump into each other, see each other at weddings. And now, what do we say now? <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> what if they would have said yes? Come on! But don't worry, this is not a revolution that requires violence. Not a revolution that requires you to sit in somewhere and get arrested. This is a revolution of opening your heart and opening your spirit and gently sharing with others of like mind. Don't go knocking at their doors, handing out tracts. It don't work. There are other people in Utah who do that. Okay. I do that. I do make comments. It's a level of commitment. I'm talking about being a revolutionary in the sense that a revolutionary is committed. She or he is determined that their cause, which is just and right, will be shared and not forgotten. There are a number of issues out there challenging us, and that's why I'm glad I, I, I brought this from you, Boutique. Have you heard the initials BDS? It's not a, another version of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> BDS is Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. It's an organized effort to isolate Israeli academics and professionals throughout the world. It is an effort to crush us economically by forcing countries and corporations that deal with Israel to divest from Israel. And of course, it's brought to us by our friends in the Anglican Church, the Church of Scotland, uh, and many liberal Protestant denominations, including much of the Methodist Church in the United States of America. So I've got ideas to share of how you can purchase Israeli products and support the economy of the nation that you will be part of. There's also something called Christian Palestinianism. Have you ever heard of the term? Oh, wonderful. First of all, let's defer, define the term Zionism. Because there are some people that write on all kinds of lists. Well, the Zionist is... Let's define Zionism. Zionism, the belief that the people of Israel should be in their land, the land of Israel. Radical concept. <laughs> yes, Pastor John Hagee is a Christian Zionist, they're Jewish Zionists, and they darn well should be Ephraimite Zionists. Oh, by the way, that's the disqualifier for being, I told you before, anyone who stands up and says to me, I'm an Ephraimite, I love them and accept them as my brother and sister. Let me tell you the disqualifier. If you say, I do not love the land of Israel, if you say, I do not love the state of Israel, by the way, I'm not talking about the current government of Israel or individual members of the Knesset. I didn't vote for them. <laughs> if you do not love your Jewish brothers and sisters, then in all reality, you ain't no Ephraimite. If you can't stand what your inheritance is and who your brothers and sisters are, you can't be part of it. So let's talk about Christian Palestinianism. So Christian Zionism is the Christian belief that, of course, they don't understand about a five, so they say the Jewish people. Let's call the people of Israel. 
should go back to the land of Israel. Of course, they have all these great eschatological things that are supposed to happen, and we're supposed to serve their purpose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let them think that. <laughs> Christian Palestinianism. Okay, they don't understand that Yeshua's name is Yeshua. So they call him Jesus. So they will tell you Jesus. Jesus, born under the military occupation. Actually, technically that's true. But it was a Roman military occupation. They lead you to believe it's the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. They speak about Jesus being crucified by the Israeli government crucifixion policy. I know it sounds bizarre, but people in the world are generally <laughs> ignorant. They don't know, they don't stop and think. Don't let them take the Yeshua that you know and love and turn him into what they describe as the first Shahid. Shahid is an Arabic word which means martyr. A Shahid are those guys who strap bombs to themselves, or better yet, to their children, and send them into pizza shops to slaughter as many men, women, and children as they can. That's the way they describe Yeshua. So yeah, that doesn't go over very well. Ezekiel 11, 17 says, Therefore says, Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered. Repeatedly this comes up over and over again. You can't ignore it. People try. He's going to take us where? It says in chapter 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. <sighs> Micha, Micah, chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. And then, just to clarify, in case we're, we're missing it, I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. Kind of like, just in case you guys are mistaking the terminology. <coughs> okay, so our to-dos. I did not come to start a new organization. There are many organizations already. You belong to an amazing community. Continue to be involved with it. There's a national organization called ARI, the Alliance of Redeemed Israel. John is involved. Wally is involved. Kathy's involved. Joy's involved. They're the only organization that defines themselves as Messianic believers supporting the reunion of Judah and Ephraim that'll let a Jewish guy come and speak there. You have no idea how many doors are not open to me. And evidently, people believe in the, re the reunion of Ephraim and Judah as being the reunion of Ephraim and Ephraim. <laughs> so I say to them, fine, don't invite me. That's cool. But then do you know what you need to do? Stop waving those banners of Judah and Ephraim. Stop calling for, oh, when Judah and Ephraim come together, because you don't believe it. This is the time, this is the era, behold, days are coming when it's time to stop merely talking the talk, but actually walking the walk. I will do everything I can, particularly through my dear friend Ken Rank, through our site on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, join with us. If you're not on Facebook, you've got my email, send me notes. Bombard me with notes. Let's stay in touch. Let's stay together. Let me share information so you can learn more about the modern state of Israel. Because we're not going back 2,000 years. You know, when people, there are people who get off the plane at Ben Gurion Airport, to them, they're in biblical Judah. They expect to be given a wooden staff, a toga. You have to wear something. 
a pair of sandals. We typically don't do that. I want you to partner with me in any way that you can. Network with me. Please share your contacts. Most people know other people in other communities. I would love to go and see them. I am one of those people who finally got to Israel and never wanted to come back to America. And here I am being pushed down. I, I, I was thinking, well, next time I'll come back will be maybe in August. So of course my daughter, who's in New York now, decides to get married on February 2nd. <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, February 2nd, a week after the wedding, okay, February 9th. For five or six weeks, I'll be traveling in America again. Of course, my dear daughter um, chose February 2nd. It turns out, by the way, I stopped following American football a gazillion years ago. That's the date of Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, my. <laughs> no, 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 no reason to be online. I mean, as she said to me, you know, I said, I, she, you know, she's looking to get married. She's getting married in New Jersey. I said, well, no big deal. The Super Bowl, Super Bowl is always played in a warm weather state, typically a dome stadium. She looks up online, calls me back. Abba, Daddy. No, it's in Giant Stadium, East Rutherford, New Jersey. <laughs> oh, no is right. <laughs> There's no dumb on it. Although rumor is that Jimmy Hoffa is in the foundation. <laughs> so perhaps that will provide some more. I have one person doing this. I go literally from borrowing the airfare from friends to come to America in the hope and the faith that somehow the Lord will help me figure this all out. I never wanted to be doing this. Not only do I hate to travel, not only am I a tour guide that needs to be guiding people, I always thought it would be someone else. Someone who's a better speaker. <coughs> someone who, is, who likes to travel. Maybe someone who's based in America. In the Pirkei Avot, in the chapters of the fathers in the Jewish tradition, there's an expression, where there are no men, be a man. I waited 20 years for someone else to stand up and do this. No one was on the horizon. <laughs> so I said, you know what, I may not be perfect, but he seems to be nudging me this way. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna try to build as many bridges as I can. I'm going to give as many hugs, verbally, figuratively, literally, as I can. I have an activist approach. Yes, it is the Lord that will bring us together at the end, with, at that final day. But I think he's waiting to see, did my correction work? Did my 2,700 years of punishment work? Are they learning? I'm going to close with um, two quick stories. And they're both from the Torah, the Torah that we share, our Torah. The first one is that wonderful story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. The masses are going towards what's called the Red Sea. It's actually the Reed Sea that we won't. Let's not be divisive. <laughs> and it's wonderful. And the Lord has said to come to the sea and to cross the sea. We're going into the promised land. We've seen the miracles of the Lord. And we're going to kind of reap the rewards. And then someone turns around and sees the dust clouds coming. Pharaoh's chariots are pursuing. The tanks of the ancient world are coming. So first of all, there are a couple of quick things when you're looking at scripture. Does it say that anybody thought about standing and fighting? No. We were a generation that were raised to be slaves. And we had a slave mentality, which is why we wound up dying off in the desert later on. But we'll do the biblical exegesis time another time. But they run to Moshe and they scream at him, Moses, do something. And he begins praying, calling to the Lord. I think the Lord was a little angry because the Lord had already given directions. 
What's the Lord's response in Hebrew? It's three words, and then I'll translate it. Ma titzake lai. Why do you cry unto me? It's implicit. I told you what to do. Why are you wasting your time crying about it? I told you to go. Go! Do it! If the text had said, just do it, I don't know what Nike would have done for Mark. <laughs> but that's the thing. I will provide you with information, with ideas, but you already know in your heart what to do. It's time to do it and not just talk. The last part is for me the most emotional part. It's times like this that I wish I really drank. <laughs> By the way, I made that comment about not drinking and never having, having gotten high when I was in the Baptist church speaking in August in Alabama. And the pastor's in the front row and he looks at me like this and goes, <laughs> I guess I'm in with the Baptists. <laughs> Who knew? It's the story of Joseph, of Yosef. It's that climactic scene. He's long since recognized his brothers. And you know what? If it were me, I would have been thinking about, oh man, this is payback time. <laughs> oh man, am I going to make these guys twist in the wind? And he's kind of playing with their heads a bit. And he hides Benjamin's cup. And you kind of wonder as you're reading it for the first time, or the hundredth time, what's the next step? What's going to happen now? And you, you sense the drama. You know, if it was, a, it was a TV movie, that's when the music would be getting loud, like dum, 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 dum. And he cries out from the depths of his soul with all the emotion in his heart, I need Yosef! I'm Joseph! What's the response of the brothers? They ain't no response. Probably because it's really hard to respond when you're like this. <laughs> now, they don't respond. They're stunned. So he's going to clarify it for them. Next verse. He screams out with every fiber of his being, Ani Yosef Achichem! I'm Joseph, your brother! That's when they really probably started feeling, oh, yeah. He told beloved dad that he had died here. Now, a little further on, does Joseph think of revenge? No. Does Joseph think of getting back at those miserable excuses for brothers? No, he rather thinks that it's the Lord's way of enabling him to go there to prepare for them. What a heart! What unconditional love he showed! Every time... The Every time in the last 20 years that I've read that verse, it has stabbed me in the heart. Because for whatever reason, and I beg the Lord to show me why, and even though, by the way, we have a standard joke in Israel, that you know, we feel that prayer in Israel is merely a local call. No roaming charges. We're, we're right there. Why show me this Ephraim Judah thing? Why me? I feel like that famous story of Moshe, Moses. The Lord tells him, go to Pharaoh. It's like, no, I got this great brother Aaron. Oh, Aaron, maybe he's here in the community. I've got, you know, I, I, I've got somebody else. Somebody, why me? And I keep meeting Joseph, male Josephs, female Josephs. And for 20 years, they've been crying out to me. And I lose sleep. And I don't know what to do to help. Which is why 
I went ahead, borrowed money, and bought a ticket to come to the United States of America. I'm a stranger in a strange land. But you have Walmart here. What a great invention. We never have that. We never have that in New York City. Walmart, I love it. And people greet you when you come in? If we had greeters in stores in Israel, we'd be like, why are you here today? <laughs> what do you want? Why are you bothering me? <laughs> but this sense of Joseph. I have heard your cries. I know you're Joseph. And that's why so far away from home, I stand before you today to tell you that I know you're Joseph. And I love you. You're my brothers and sisters. And I'm here to find a way for us to work together, to share that love, to show Avinu Shabashamayim, our Father in Heaven. By the way, that's the, the, the we have a national prayer for the State of Israel. It starts with Avinu Shabashamayim, our Father in Heaven. That may sound like another prayer that you guys made. <laughs> yeah. Oh, people told you that was a Christian prayer. <laughs> Jokes on you. That's a standard Jewish formula, by the way. Just wanted to let you know. But I have felt the cries. I have felt the pain. All right, I said, I told the story in Nevada. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can we say Las Vegas? Can I say Vegas? Yes. Yeah. I told my daughters, I said, Abba, where are you going in America? So I said, I'm going to Montana. I'm going to Oregon. I'm going to, I'm going to Las Vegas. Pause. <laughs> Cirque du Soleil or Showgirls? <laughs> <laughs> The first answer would have been the better one, Cirque du Soleil. I said, no, I, I, I'm actually, I'm, you know, they were Ephraimites in Las Vegas, too. And they're looking at me like, yeah, I'm like, you know, right. which casino is that, Abba? <laughs> my harshest critics, my daughters. When I spoke at the Army conference, I was slated to speak Sunday morning, which was actually the worst time slot for me because I had to catch flights. So literally everything was going like clockwork, and the, the, the presentation with the banners and the, and the dancing and all the stuff was taking too long. And I'm like, oh. Ken got up there, he did his, it was wonderful a moving speech. And it's on YouTube, by the way. If you go onto YouTube onto United to Restore, you can see there's an introduction by Frank Hounds, who I believe people in the community know. Frank does a wonderful job of laying out the history behind our dysfunctional family. Ken speaks, and it's a beautiful speech. It's about prayer and worship. I went and did my thing, and then Baki Wooten does a beautiful version of a reading of Ezekiel 37. Although they were miking me, I thought they were putting it on a DVD. Ken, through his connections and calling in some favors, made a whole video out of this. It's on YouTube. Before that video went out, my dear friend Saber Joins said, I'm trying to get Hanok's speaking dates. People don't know who he is. Can we take, before the video is ready, can we take a few snippets? I love that word, snippets. <laughs> and create a, a short video, which they did. Sabra and Ken created it, six minutes, 24 seconds. Between those two videos, before I left Israel, there were close to 5,000 views already. So there were people out there that were listening to this. So, I came to America, I spoke in Kentucky, living in a trailer like a rock star. <laughs> I spoke twice in Georgia, twice in Alabama, and here I am, at this wonderful thing, this wonderful event, Ari, the only messianic organization dedicated to the return of Ephraim and Judah that will allow a Jewish person who doesn't believe exactly what they believe to walk in the door. Who actually believes in the concept of a family reunion. What a concept. So, within 10 minutes after I finish, I'm in a car going to Orlando International Airport. Catch my JetBlue flight. What a great airline. <laughs> wow. 
to New York. My youngest daughter meets me there with the rest of my luggage. We change bags. I'm sitting for three and a half hours. Now understand, I left Orlando Sunday before noon. I catch American Airlines flight to Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. I have a four hour layover. I have a run in with LL security because I don't speak French. Why am I in France? I'm traveling alone and I don't have luggage. Yeah, it's because American Airlines is transferred. It's one of those you know, they, they, we speak, I, I of course answered them in Hebrew. I said, I'm, I'm an American Israeli. Why would I speak French? It's all you, you're in France. It's kind of like Inspector Clouseau. I'm in France for four hours. Come on. I'm an emotional rag. I catch my flight from Paris back home. I get home 9 o'clock Monday night. I believed, because I hadn't traveled in many years, that I could will myself to not experience jet lag. No. <laughs> Talk about, th there's a difference between faith, by the way, and stupidity. <laughs> this falls in the category of stupidity. I had scheduled tours to guide in the Western Wall Tunnels Tuesday morning. Oh. 5.40 in the morning, I'm on the bus to Jerusalem. I'm driving through the hills of Sharon, Samaria. To me, it was incredibly emotional. I had just left a fire in America. Here are the hills of Samaria. This is great. I guide at 8 o'clock. I guide another group after. And by 10.15, I'm feeling a little, a little loopy. I do my shopping for vegetables. For those who've been in Jerusalem, in the Machani Yehuda Shuk in the open marketplace. I catch the bus back to Modi'in, which I affectionately know as Motown. No <laughs> one else in Israel calls it that, but I do. <laughs> so I'm back in Motown, Wednesday, I'm cooking. Why am I cooking? Because Wednesday night is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, Yom Tua. Oh, yeah. Now, after spending a weekend with Ephraimites at a conference, hearing the shofar being blown every 15 seconds, the last thing I needed to do was go to the Beit Knesset at the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and hear the shofar blow. But I did it. At that point, though, I'm experiencing horrific jet lag. I can't sleep. I can't think. Shabbat morning. Typically, the only time of the week that I sleep well is Friday night to Shabbat morning. No phone, no computer, nothing to sleep. I'm up at 3.51 in the morning. I can't fall back to sleep. And by the way, I joke, that's the curse, by the way, of digital clocks. Because you don't say, oh, I got up before 4. I got up after 3. I got up at 3.51. <laughs> I'm exhausted. But I'm quiet because my daughter is there with friends in all the bedrooms. And I, you know, I'm walking around the living room. I don't know what to do. So I turn and I open the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, for consolation. And unless I'm studying something in particular, I always just open up and wherever it falls in the prophets, that's what I read and study. Falls to Jeremiah. <laughs> Jeremiah is usually not terribly upbeat. Particularly not the pages I was on. <laughs> I'm feeling incredibly miserable, very tired. I'm sitting in the chair in the living room. It's the pre-dawn hours and I'm kind of falling asleep. And then I began having this kind of dream, hallucination, vision, image, whatever you want to call it, and I began envisioning myself as Judah. Not one of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Yehuda ben Yaakov. Judah. Joseph's older brother. I know that sounds really wacky, and I will see a therapist when I get back to this <laughs> because it's very strange. And I began actually, in my mind, seeing Joseph being lowered into the pen. Now I'm the older brother. I should have said enough with this. Enough! Bring him up already! Oh, yeah, you know, we read scripture. Judah convinced them they shouldn't kill him. They still left him in the pit to be sold as a slave. I began feeling these horrific waves of guilt and shame. I know this out loud. Right. 
And the next thing I think of is that I'm replaying the scenario today. I'm watching Joseph in the pit, in the exile, but this time, this time is different. This time I'm not walking away. This time I am not abdicating <coughs> my responsibility. This time I've got to figure out a way to get Joseph out of that pit. I'm overwhelmed because I can't figure it out by myself. So I need you to help me help you. I need you and your love and partnership to help me help us. I will not walk away from you. I will not walk away from you this time because the other thing that I see is as scary. Because this time too, I look on the horizon and I see the Ishmaelites coming again. And they are coming for you. I will not abandon you. I don't know how to get you out of the pit yet. Together we'll work on it. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. Thank you for your time today. I love you all. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much.